What is a home lab server? Does it really need to be a big, loud, 19 inch rack beast that eats electricity for breakfast? I don't think so. I recently bought this little PC here second hand on eBay for roughly 200 bucks. It's got an Intel i5 processor with 4 cores. It's small and silent. I upgraded the RAM to 16 gigabytes and I added a terabyte SSD drive. Now let's install a software called Proxmox on it that provides virtualization in VMs, so virtual machines or Linux containers as well as many many other enterprise scale features such as software defined storage, replication, backup, thin storage provisioning as well as high availability. Stay tuned. Please use the chapter markers and the timeline if you want to skip parts of the videos. You can see the sections here on the timeline. Those are the chapters. I have also put them into the description. In the last video we built a little home lab server on Ubuntu Server 20 that runs VirtualBox, Docker, Webmin and Portana. That works perfectly if you want to have an always on device where you run for example your home automation software on and a file server for example. Today we are going to take this to the next level. What do I mean by that? Enterprises or large corporations have started to virtualize their environments a couple of years ago. What that means is that rather than buying hundreds of servers on metal or tin like it's called in IT for each service, they buy that one or two big fat servers and run many servers as virtual machines on those. They use technologies like KVM or QMU very often on VMware ESX servers. These solutions are enterprise scale and so is their price tag. In one of the last sessions with you guys on my Discord server, someone pointed out that he's using a software called Proxmox to run his machines on. Following up on this I had a look at it and I must say that I'm amazed. Their business model is such that the software is free but if you want support and maintenance like you need it in the enterprise then you just pay for that. I like that business model because it gives us hobbyists the possibility to use enterprise scale solutions and at the same time provides revenue for the company and ultimately for the developers. Enough talking, now let's go. As usual when I set up a new machine I use Ventoy in order to boot from a USB stick. I have downloaded the Proxmox ISO from their website and boot from it. The Proxmox installation is wizard driven so the installer asks me for the most important technical details such as my new user account, the network parameters etc. Once I have answered all those questions the installer starts copying files and installs Proxmox on the server. That does take a couple of minutes. You can see at the bottom that it installs .deb packages. Proxmox is in fact Debian Linux with additional tools and its own kernel distribution. At the end of the installation the installer tells me that I can now browse to port 8006 on my server once I have rebooted it. Awesome! We have successfully installed Proxmox on that little PC. We can now remove the screen and keyboard and move the PC to our network rack. From now on we will run it headless. That means access it over the network only. Just a little remark on the hardware choice though. If you want to run virtual machines then what you want is as many CPU cores as possible. This PC has 4 cores. If you want more then you can either use a PC with an Intel i7 processor which would provide 8 cores or if you want to play serious use a server scale processor like the AMD EPIC. There are also low power versions of that such as the EPIC 3251 which runs at roughly 50 watts. Here is a quick comparison. We need to be careful here because to some extent this is comparing apples to pears. The AMD EPIC is a server scale processor while the i5 is made for desktops. The EPIC focuses on cores and hyperthreading while the i5 has integrated graphics and so on. Also the i5 is much older. From a benchmark perspective the EPIC is 2 to 3 times more powerful but this is mainly because of the multiple cores. If we compare one single thread then they are roughly even. Where things become interesting is the CPU mark per dollar. And here the i5 actually beats the EPIC. 
But this is no surprise as older CPUs generally have better values here than newer ones. I'm particularly interested in the cost of running it over the year as the device will be always on. And this is where the i5 is roughly 30% lower than the Epic. So as you can see, the Epic is definitely much more powerful, but so is the price tag. For me, the little i5 will do. I'm not planning to mine cryptocurrency or anything like that. Cool, let's have a look at the Proxmox interface. The Proxmox user interface is an HTTPS frontend. That means that you don't need any type of client other than a web browser. From this interface, you can do all administrative tasks on your Proxmox server because there is also an integrated shell. So if ever the GUI does not provide what you need, to, then you can most certainly do it from the shell. Proxmox by design is enterprise scale. Hence, you could add multiple nodes and do high availability between the nodes and also run backups or replication between them. I only have one node here. If you want to provide exabytes of storage, then you can also install Ceph, which can provide object, block and file storage on a large scale. After the installation, Proxmox defines two default logical volumes with LVM, one for the root drive and one as a local storage for images and containers and VMs. Another nice thing is the deep integration with ZFS, which is a deduplicating file system. That means a ZFS volume can store more data than the actual volume size because it would only store redundant blocks of data once. A lot of stuff in here. Of course, the usual admin things such as logs, DNS, network, etc. are here as well. A real one-stop shop. So as you can see, there are a lot of options and possibilities here. I will only use a fraction of those. First, let me set up my network in storage. Two things need a bit of tweaking in my personal environment. The first one is the fact that I have multiple VLANs, one for my LAN, one for the guests and one for my IoT devices. I'm running Shinobi as a CCTV software in order to record footage for my surveillance cameras. And those cameras are in segregated IoT networks because I do not want them to phone home to their vendor. Also, I do not want the traffic from Shinobi to the webcams to go over the VLAN because that would put load on my router and make the available bandwidth for other things lower in my network. Therefore, I added a USB Ethernet card and connected it directly to the IoT network where my cameras are. The only thing that did not work well with the GUI was actually to configure the network adapters for DHCP. That needed to be done in the config files. Configuring the storage to me means that I just added a 5TB USB disk where I store all my files. Adding storage to Proxmox can be done on the data center level, which is logical because it might be replicated over multiple nodes. In my case, I have just added a directory on the disk, which can store all types of information such as disk images, ISO files, containers or templates and backup. My plan is to use the fast internal SSD for the disk images and use the slower external spinning hard drive for file data such as music, videos, photos and documents and provide mount points on the disk to the containers as needed. Great, so now the system has one leg in each of my networks, one in IoT and one in the LAN. I can therefore access my video cameras in the IoT network directly over the switch without having to go over the router. The big disk that I added over the USB port can be used for storing files and the internal SSD can be used to store virtual machines and containers. Actually, let me create my first virtual machine. I want to quickly import an OpenWRT router image, which we have created in the first VirtualBox episode and set the networks accordingly. Let's migrate that machine from VirtualBox to Proxmox. In VirtualBox, I click on File, then Export Appliance and then I pick the machine to export. The open standard to migrate virtual machines from one platform to the other is called Open Virtual Appliance OVA or Open Virtualization Format OVF. Just need to include a so-called manifest file that contains the actual description of the VM. Once I click on Export, then VirtualBox creates the OVA file for me. Next, I need to transfer it to the Proxmox server. In order to do this, I use FileZilla, so I just copy the OVA file over to the Proxmox server. Switching over to the console of my PVE node, I can see that the file is there. The tool which we will use to migrate is called QM. Quickly launching QM without any options shows this help page. 
the two options that will be interesting for us are import OVF and import disk. But first we need to unpack the OVA file, which is in fact a simple tar file. So let's do this by typing tar-xvf and then the file name. Now we can import the VM using qm import OVF and give it a new machine ID, which in my case I chose to be 201, followed by the name of the manifest file and then we need to tell Proxmox where to put it. Unfortunately, it did not import the disk, so we need to do this manually using the import disk option. Same game. Need to give it the ID of the machine, the file name, the target storage, plus you can specify the target format of the disk. We can see here that the disk has been imported. However, on the VM it is still listed as unused, so we need to quickly attach it by just double clicking it or clicking edit and checking the parameters. Once I click on add, then the hard disk is probably attached to the right controller. Cool, let's start it. As we can see, group starts in the VM and launches OpenWRT. Here we go. OpenWRT is up and running in that VM and the first thing I want to do is check the network interfaces. Like we did in the first VirtualBox episode. So let me first stop the VM. I need to create an internal network as a LAN interface for the virtual router. That can be done under network of course. I add a Linux bridge and give it an IP, subnet and gateway. Next, just add the two interfaces to the VM and connect back in and Surprise! Proxmox wants to boot the VM over PXE. I had not checked the boot order after having added the IDE disk manually, so I need to do that quickly. Here we go, restarting the VM. And it looks like the network interfaces are up, here we go. Just the LAN interface still has the old VirtualBox network range, but I can change this in the OpenWRT GUI. All good? As you can see, using the Open Virtual Appliances format OVA is a fairly easy way of migrating complete servers from one virtualization platform to another, like I just did from VirtualBox to Proxmox. Next, let's just try and install a new virtual machine with Windows on it. Right after this, call to action. I need you to get involved. I would love to hear from you if you are using virtualization technologies like VMware, VirtualBox, Proxmox, Docker, Kubernetes, Zen, ESX. If yes, which ones are you using and what are you doing with it? Please do leave me a comment. Many thanks guys. Over to our Windows installation. The first thing we need is an installation DVD, an ISO file. This can be uploaded directly to Proxmox by selecting the right storage, then content and then click on upload. The content type of course is ISO and I just pick a Windows 10 ISO file here. Takes a while and here we go, it's uploaded and appears in the list. Now we can go ahead and create a new virtual machine by clicking on the blue Create VM button in the upper right corner of the Proxmox interface. We need to specify all the parameters such as the operating system, the location of the ISO and of the disk image, CPUs and memory, attach it to the right network. Just one thing I want to point to because I think it's really awesome. Proxmox can provide access to remote display either over VNC or over SPICE. SPICE is a nice way of having a seamless remote display very much like with RDP. I have the remote viewer installed on my system and can now walk through the installation as if I was sitting in front of the machine. SPICE can do much more such as map local USB devices to the remote machine, very powerful. Let's stop that here. Installing Windows is not the main topic of this video. I'm sure you know how to do that. Just wanted to show how it can be done. Great! So now we can install virtually anything on those virtual machines. But there is another thing here in Proxmox that is very powerful. Those are the Linux containers or LXC. If you want to run something under Linux, but it doesn't need a hypervisor, that means it does not have to have its own operating system, but could eventually use the kernel of the host machine, then LXC might be a good fit for you. Let's have a look. Very much like Docker, where we have images and a Docker registry with standard images, 
We have something similar here which is called templates. The command to use in order to get a list of the available templates is pvim. pvim update pulls the current list of available templates and pvim available lists them. I can then download them using the pvim download command. Checking on my storage content, I can see that the container templates are available. Please note the small size. The Alpine template is only 2.3 megabytes in size and even the full Ubuntu 20 only accounts for 200 megabytes. In order to create a new container, I click on the blue create CT icon. Here I need to type a couple of parameters as well in the wizard, such as an identifier number for the container, a host name, a root password, and then I can select one of the templates. Let's create a real slim Ubuntu 18 machine with one CPU and two gigabytes of RAM. The wizard creates the container for me and says, task OK, all good. I can now see the container in my Proxmox environment and start it. If I wanted to have graphics in that container, I could even do that by installing GNOME and using X2Go in order to access re it remotely. But typically you would probably rather use a container headless and run a file server or home automation software on it and access it over a web frontend. As we could see, the LXC virtualization is a perfect way to run a complete Linux machine but without the overhead of a virtual machine. But how is this different from Docker? And why would you want to use it? Well, Docker is actually based on LXC. It is basically LXC with a couple of tools around it. Plus, you can run Docker in so-called swarms if you need, for example, more compute power or if you need to serve another thousand users. In the enterprise, this is mostly done with Kubernetes, which provides additional clustering and scale-out possibilities. In the home environment, people use Docker to run stuff in containers and when something is broken, you just scrap the container and rebuild it. Now, the Proxmox approach to Linux containers, LXC, is much more similar to virtual machines. In other words, if you can't get your head around Docker, then this might be the way for you to go and use container technology. Proxmox gives a couple of additional tools, such as, for example, sizing the disk space for a container with a quota. That makes sure that a container doesn't grow above its limits. Awesome, guys. That's all I wanted to show you today. In the next episode, I will use Proxmox in order to migrate my old home server into a virtual machine on Proxmox on the new server. So I will show how to virtualize a physical machine. Until then, many, many thanks for watching, liking and subscribing. Please do not forget to leave me a thumbs up and a comment. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Bye for now.